My name is Damian Curry. I'm the technical manager for business development here at Nginx. And, and, my, and my name is Juan Villa. I'm a solutions architect with AWS. Yeah, and we're just going to be talking about you know, how you can build your application and, and scale your web app with Nginx and AWS. So to start, we have developed what we've pushed out to an AWS Quick Start. And we're just going to do a real quick high level kind of overview here. Um, it's basically an example application and application architecture that's kind of the best case scenario for how to build an, a, your environment in AWS using Nginx and the built-in AWS tooling. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's a lot going on, but we're going to go ahead and, and go through each kind of different process. So this is a quick overview. There's a few different components here. We have Nginx Plus that's handling the application level intelligent routing and load balancing. Uh, there's Nginx open source application web servers on the back end. Um, then we have Amazon auto scaling groups that are scaling the Nginx Plus load balancers as well as the application servers. And then we're also using the Amazon Classic Load Balancer or Network Load Balancer that provides the cross AZ routing. Um, using Amazon Route 53 for global load balancing and all of this being built into Amazon VPCs. And one thing I wanted to add to that as well, if you guys didn't catch it, there's a little bit going on in the architecture diagram. Don't worry about writing that stuff down or memorizing that stuff. This is a quick start. It is publicly available on AWS's website. It comes with documentation. You can pull up that same exact diagram. And better yet, the quick start means you can give it a role in your own account and see how it works, see how it looks like from the console and actually get to touch it, customize it and learn more about it that way. So we led with that and now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into kind of how that's built. And we're gonna start talking about Nginx Plus and the AWS load balancers. So as, you're, as you all are probably familiar, AWS does offer load balancers and has for quite a few years. Um, the oldest of these is called the Classic Load Balancer now. It used to be called the Elastic Load Balancer without the word classic in front of it. Um, this is a, a, a fairly simple load balancer that does not do layer seven routing. It is not aware of paths. It is aware of the HTTP protocol and the HTTPS protocols. Um, it can do SSL offloading and it's used traditionally to put in front of basic applications, simple applications that might be on a scaling group, for example, and they scale up, scale down and you want to do a very basic round robin. I want to send, you know, all my requests evenly distributed to all my applications, right? So it's a very quick, easy to go to for a very basic application. Um, this is not very real world, honestly. Once you start getting to real world applications, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, and that kind of leads us into the next slide um, where we talk about what's called the application load balancer. The application load balancer we recently introduced, well, sort of recently, um, and the application load balancer is layer seven aware. It can do some basic layer seven routing operations, like for example, path-based routing, and it can do host-based routing. Those are the two layer seven operations that an application load balancer can do. And they're used a lot today for things like uh, microservices architectures, right? Where you might have uh, an instance type, or in this case, we call it a service, right? So like in this diagram, you have a textbook service. That might be a scaling group with four EC2 instances, right? The next one, college service, could be a whole bunch of containers running in an ECS cluster, in, in an actual Docker cluster, right? Maybe powered by ECS if it's on AWS. Um, so the application load balancer lets you route traffic to them with some customizable parameters, um, but it doesn't give you every single little bit of customization that you might need for your application. It really depends, right? And that kind of leads us into the third approach, um, which is actually leveraging Nginx um, in combination with one of our load balancers in front of it. Specifically for this diagram, I call out classic and network load balancer, but I would encourage you guys to look a lot into that network load balancer. It's a, it's a much newer load balancer. It is not at all aware about HTTP. It does not operate at that layer of the stack. It is aware of TCP, and it basically forwards those TCP connections and requests to Nginx Plus, which is very well aware of HTTP and has very powerful layer seven routing capabilities as well as many other capabilities um, that allow you to do things like data transformation and routing in ways you can't do with the other routers, right? 
This is a very typical topology that I see with customers. A lot of our customers that build real world applications, that build SaaS solutions, um, where they might be providing a service for the IT industry or for any other industry, and they operate at what we call cloud scale. So they have thousands of customers. They serve millions of requests daily. It is very common to see an architecture that kind of looks like this. This is a very basic stick figure diagram, really. The real world architectures are a bit more complex than this. But at, at its actual core, we see Nginx in it a lot. And we see it because of its capabilities. Next slide. Um, so I presented three different diagrams, one with a classic load balancer, one with an application load balancer, and then the final one with Nginx. Um, and here I want to highlight in, in this slide, it's a little bit of a wall of text, so I, I apologize for it. But I do want to get a couple things across. Um, on what the differences are between these load balancers and when you would use one over the other. Um, if, if you guys leave with anything today, what I want you to leave with is to make sure that you think about using the right tool for the right job, which means that depending on the application, the problem you're trying to solve, the requirements your business has in, uh, like put in front of you, you might need to choose one load balancer application over another. When talking about the Amazon Classic network load balancers and application load, load balancers, those are fully managed products by AWS. There's no instances to run or operate, and they give you enough tweaking and tuning knobs for certain applications. Depends on the kind of application that, that, that you're deploying and the control mechanisms that you need. Right? And then in the other side, you have Nginx Plus, which is often, like I mentioned before, used in combination with our own load balancers to provide an extra layer of configuration, of performance. And in many cases, it helps save cost on AWS because of the capabilities and the things it can do to help you cost optimize in other parts of your architecture. Um, things like layer seven routing, not just path-based, but it can also do header-based routing and a whole bunch of other features. I'm gonna let Damien talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, and, and then, I mean, you obviously get into the, I mean, the header-based and the, the route, the path-based routing is a very common use case, but then also we've just been adding more and more features, things like full gRPC load balancing support so that you can have that end-to-end -end authentication there and, you know, handling things like JWT authentication at the load balancer layer. So you can handle your authentication at Nginx and go ahead and just pass whatever information is needed to the application so your application doesn't need to know how to deal with a JWT token. Um, as well as, you know, we have a ton of monitoring, a lot more statistics we expose with Nginx Plus. So you can be very proactive. You can easily see if there's an issue with your site. You can be very easy to track it down to where that problem is. And then overall, just you know, giving you the flexibility so that if you need to you know, set a specific header, block specific headers, all of that logic can be built into the Nginx layer. And then we can go ahead and lay, leverage that network load balancer to allow Nginx to scale horizontally. So that you're not, you, know, you, you can just add more, you can have an auto scaling group, and just add more Nginx load balancers as your load increases. Yep, and that's actually one of the hard things when you're dealing at cloud scale, is the aspect of horizontally scaling and managing that horizontal scale can be difficult. Traditionally in data centers that was done using things like VIPs or virtual IPs with solutions like Heartbeat or some kind of agent daemon that was running, trying to see what instances were up and it would change IP address allocations on the fly to whatever was active and it's a very complex thing to do right when you leverage that network load balancer in front of nginx it takes that complexity completely masks it away you don't have to deal with that you don't have to worry about that you let the network load balancer do what it does really well and then you let nginx do what it does really well right so you combine two very powerful pieces to basically serve as your front end to your entire application that gives you this wealth of features and services while keeping simplicity in your architecture and then, you know, to move on to the next thing, uh, you know, above that we have the idea of the Route 53 Global Server Load Balancer. Which, yep. So um, one of the things that we see a lot of our customers do is when they're designing their application for performance, they want to have their application as close to their customers as possible, right? They they might have customers in Asia, they might have customers in Europe. Um, and in many ways, in many cases, this is done with something called content distribution networks. 
But that works really well when you have a lot of static content and not too much dynamic content. A lot of the really big companies and customers out there building SaaS solutions that provide very valuable services to other businesses tend to not really be very static applications. They're very much dynamic applications with customer data and databases that need to be constantly queried. So the best solution for performance there is an active, active multi-region configuration where your application is hosted simultaneously maybe in the east coast of the US, the west coast, maybe it's in Ireland, and maybe it's also in Japan. Right, and Route 53 is the AWS global DNS managed service that you can use to make that happen. Um, you can use latency-based routing to automatically direct customers closest to a particular instance or region to that region. So they're not, say, in Europe talking to your California, you know, your like West Coast region. Um, and it can also do uh, like fail. It can do health checks and failover routes. So if you also have a disaster in one of these regions because of an application failure or a failure on the AWS side or a geographic disaster of some kind that cuts off the network um, or whatever might happen, you can also use Route 53 to direct customers who previously accessed one region to access another region. So you have both performance and disaster recovery baked in. Um, and then in the event that you only need disaster recovery, this is still also a very viable solution because you can use Route 53 with GSLBs and failovers to have an active region and then have a passive region that we a lot of times call our pilot light region, depending on how much infrastructure you have running in that region. Because running two regions can be usually about twice as expensive as running one region if you run at the exact same scale. So a lot of our customers run a reduced capacity region, which is the pilot light, their active region. If there's a failure of some kind, they quickly scale their pilot region and redirect all traffic to the pilot region. All that can be automated in AWS. And, and again, in this particular scenario, Nginx is the front end for all of these. Yeah, and this is another, as, as Juan was saying, this is another way that you can allow you to scale Nginx horizontally without the use of the network load balancer. So if there is a requirement, something that's happening at the network load balancer that doesn't work for your specific use case, this is another solution to allow you to have that horizontal scaling and not have to have anything in front of Nginx as well. So then next, so now we've talked about kind of the, that front entrance point. Now we're talking about what happens behind Nginx. So when you're dealing with it, things like Am in Amazon, I mean, auto scaling groups is one of the big upsides of at working in a cloud architecture. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's really one of the original, original scaling mechanisms that AWS had, right? It, it's, it's the thing that solved a lot of issues within IT, which was requesting hardware, right? You have a company, you have a successful idea, and you want to scale it, but the traditional way involved sending a ticket to some antiquated ticket system and then waiting 14 weeks for someone to come back and say, like, hey, do you, do you still need help? Um, true story, happened in my last few jobs. So not a fun experience. So with auto scaling though, you have the ability to basically create what's called a template, um, which defines the EC2 instance type that you wanna use and any startup uh, information or scripts essentially that you wanna provide to it. Um, and then you define what your scaling bounds are. Generally you start with some minimal amount of scaling and then you have an automated trigger that will automatically scale that group based on some metric. That metric is left up to you. This is not like automatically done. Most of our customers will scale on things like latency. So when you have an application that's serving API like requests, it's usually doing backend operations like querying a database. If the application is getting overloaded, it is very, it's usually very common to see the latency of those requests go up. And so a lot of our customers use latency as their metric for scaling. And then Amazon automatically adds EC2 instances. But most importantly, but even more important than that, honestly, is scaling down. Scaling down is how you cut cost, right? If your traffic does not forever go up, which for most customers, it does not. It is very busy at a particular time of the day or a particular time at night, depending on what your industry is. You also want to be able to scale down to cut costs. You don't want to be running application servers that have 0% load on them and are hardly serving requests. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to dynamically add and dynamically remove uh, the application servers from the auto scaling group. Auto scaling groups accomplish that beautifully. It's what they're really good at. Um, and then right in front of that would be your Nginx proxy using them as upstream servers, right? Yeah. Well, and so this is more of the, the traditional architecture you'll see where an auto scaling group usually by default has a classic load balancer associated with it. So as those instances get brought online, they get added to that, that load balancer. Um, 
this is adding another hop. It's adding you know, slightly more complexity. And it's also hiding information from Nginx, because it's not able to have all of the information to make routing decisions to those upstream servers, because it's just sending traffic to a single endpoint. Um, so what we came up with um, is an auto scaling group and a sync tool that works with Nginx Plus. So what it is, is it's a daemon that runs on the Nginx server. And it is communicating with the AWS SDK endpoint. And it's querying it. And as the AWS endpoint is adding or removing servers, it's making API calls to the dynamic reconfiguration API of Nginx Plus to add and remove those servers as they're going up and down. So that way, Nginx has the ability to see the information about all of those systems. It can use you know, the least time routing and, and load balancing features and functionality to make those intelligent decisions directly to the upstream servers without having to go through another layer of load balancing. Yep, and not to mention that, so, that some of the information that would have gotten obfuscated in the event of there being a classic load balancer between the Nginx proxy and your application servers is also the low-level information on how each upstream server is performing with regards to the request, right? When yeah. you look at a product like Nginx Plus, um, you have the ability to see the individual upstream server performance that would have otherwise been hidden, essentially, and looked, and looked like just one upstream server before. It now looks like the number of upstream servers it really is. It could be three, could be five in Nginx via this actual plugin has the ability to remove them in and out of rotation automatically from yeah. that upstream collection. So that's another important point to note, right? Mm -hmm. and, and while this system relies on a daemon that runs on your node with Nginx and is handling that communication, uh, there's also functionality that has been created by AWS that allows us to leverage another resolver function in Nginx that is the uh, service discover functionality built into Route 53. Yep. So this is yet another feature that we recently announced, um, which is a service discovery functionality uh, that is actually part of the Route 53 service and is actually also integrated with other AWS services such as ECS. So what this actually does is, for example, if you have an ECS cluster and you have a group of containers defined as a service, then when those come up, you can actually register with Route 53 service discovery where this service is located, what port it's running on, what IP address it's running on. When you're using technology like Docker, right, or using something that sits on top of Docker, like, for example, Kubernetes, and you're dealing with things called pods, right, at that point, you're treating your infrastructure like like cattle. They're not pets. You don't give them names. You don't know what they're going to be called because you don't care. You just know that you have 156 of something and it's performing a job. But that 156 could have a different port and a different IP and that can change based on availability, hosts going up and down. That's where service discovery is very important. And when these services register who they are and where they're at and how they can be reached with Route 53, then now you have Nginx have the ability to query this service discovery and basically ask it, oh, I need to know the IP address and port of my textbook service instances running in my Kubernetes cluster, right? It could be five, it could be six of them running across three different hosts across six different ports. Right, that's, that's really the power of that integration and that combination, and you will see service discovery a lot in microservices architectures and a lot of really modern architectures. Um, Route 53 service discovery is not the only service discovery feature that you'll see. Um, there's others like Console yeah. and, and Nginx works yeah. well with others and, as well. And the way that we implemented this functionality gives you the ability, so when you're defining an upstream group, instead of creating a list of IP addresses and port numbers, you're defining a DNS name and as well as a resolver to query that DNS name and how often you want it to be queried. And then on that schedule, Nginx Plus will go return that SRV record, see what information is included in that, and then adjust its running configuration to match. So it's handling all on the fly. And like I said, we, we built this in such a way that it's not just for Route 53. It, it integrates with console. It integrates with all of the different service discovery that use those SRV records to share information between nodes. Yep. And for those that are not familiar, when you're working with DNS servers, you have different types of records, A records, like CNAME records, text records. An SRV record is just another kind of record within, within a DNS server that can contain not just an IP address like you would typically see in an A record, but can also contain a port. Um, and that's very important because applications are not usually reached at IP addresses, they're reached at IP addresses with ports. Yeah. 
Um, and so that kind of covers, so this is kind of the general architecture. So that, that big diagram we showed, these are all the different moving parts and how you can kind of combine these all together to have just a very scalable, resilient application. Um, next, we're going to talk about actually a new feature in AWS. Yes. That this is, is a really great thing. And uh, we've been working closely with AWS to, to get this to work for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So this is yet another uh, new feature uh, that AWS has launched. And this is a, a fairly newer one than the other ones that, that I've mentioned. It's called Private Link. Um, it existed before, um, just not under the name of Private Link. And it was not something that you could leverage in your own infrastructure to connect your own services together. It used to be called VPC endpoints only, where you have the ability to, for example, create a VPC endpoint to S3, which meant that from your VPC, you didn't have to go over the internet to access S3. Pretty much all of our AWS services have public endpoints. That's how you talk to them. And even if you are within AWS, you still talk to them via their public endpoints. Um, depending on a regulation that you might be trying to meet, you might be working in a highly regulated environment. It could be a banking industry, it could be the medical industry, for example, two really highly regulated industries. They have uh, some limitations around traffic over the internet for very obvious reasons. The internet really is a wild west. So things like encryption are important. Things like data integrity are important. Um, with private link, you circumvent the internet. That's what private link is is the ability to connect two things and two VPCs, for example, or a VPC with one of our services um, over a private network, or in this case, a private link, hence the name, um, where the traffic will flow with a guarantee that this traffic does not flow over the internet, which then helps your customers, helps you meet those regulatory requirements of no traffic over the internet. Um, you also have the option of encrypting that traffic as well if you want to on top of the private link itself. Mm -hmm. So a very typical use case for this would be um, if, you, if you're a SaaS provider, right? If you provide some kind of service, like let's say you are in the, in the like customer billing industry and you have a SaaS platform that you know, collects customer bills and aggregates them and, and can send out payments and whatnot and you've built a whole SaaS and customers pay you by the user per month and you have an API and you want other customers of yours to integrate with your platform so that they can consume what they're paying. You can expose your SaaS to those other customers also running on AWS via a private link. Mm -hmm. So now they have the ability to communicate and talk to this SaaS that you've built, almost like it is a shared services VPC running in the customer's own AWS account, because you have that ability to basically make a private connection that does not go over the internet. Yeah, and then where the complication came in is, obviously if you're familiar with AWS, you have complete power over what your IP address scheme is inside your VPC. So there's no way to guarantee that two people's VPCs aren't going to have overlapping address space, which creates all sorts of networking nightmares. Amazon uh, fixes problem with using a proxy protocol V2 implementation that includes information about that VPC and a bunch of magic that happens at the back end. Uh, the problem here was there was no solution to allow layer seven load balancing from Amazon themselves or anyone uh, with this proxy protocol v2 information. So we worked to actually implement this in Nginx Plus so that when that request comes in, if you are a SaaS provider, you can have Nginx behind there and make routing decisions based on what the customer is that's coming in and be able to take that information and more importantly than making routing decisions, be able to take that information out of a proxy protocol v2 header, decrypt it in Nginx and attach it as a regular header that your application can understand. So again, you're not having to go ahead and implement the proxy protocol v2 in your application. You can let Nginx do that work and handle all that part of it. Yeah, and I think I think you already mentioned that, but this is something that was introduced in Nginx's very latest release of yeah. Nginx Plus R, R16. Um, and, and this is very important, right? He mentioned layer seven routing. If you have microservices architecture, if you do path-based routing, if you do host-based routing, if you do any routing other than round robin TCP load balancing, you are gonna need something that can do layer, layer seven routing. So it's, again, very, very typical to see something like Nginx in front to serve that purpose. And in this configuration, you also have a network load balancer in front of Nginx as well that's still solving that problem of horizontal scaling and you know not having to do things like heartbeat and moving IPs around and things like that, right? The NLB takes care of that for you, sends traffic to the Nginx instance in a highly available fashion, and Nginx takes care of the rest. Um, and sort of in summary to a lot of these slides that we just presented, 
these are not mutually exclusive configurations. These are not mutually exclusive slides and topologies and architectures. These are very much building blocks that can pretty much be combined in almost any way. So when you're thinking about building your next application or when you're trying to solve an existing problem with something that with the application that you're working with where you're not happy maybe with the way that load balancing is being done, you know, think back to these slides. Think back to to some of these basic architectures that involve just a network load balancer and Nginx to solve a lot of these problems. Um, one thing that I, I definitely want to mention is we've seen things, at least from our end, from AWS's perspective, when I, when I work with customers, I've seen, when I talk to customers about why they use Nginx, because that is a question I do ask when we're going over architecture diagrams, I have to know why you're using this, why you're using that, because there's often a really good reason for it. Um, a lot of customers use it because they have already rules that, that they've built, maybe with Nginx clusters that, that used to run on-premises. Or they use it to add headers and things that cannot be done in applications that they don't want to modify because the application might be on a, on a six-month release cycle and they can't touch it to add HSTS headers, for example, to the application to meet some security requirement, right? Those kinds of operations, adding HSTS headers, support for course, those kinds of things, like JWT authentication, like JWT authentication, can be done in a front-end proxy in front of your applications, which makes it easier, right? If you have distributed teams working on app servers and they might be in four different countries, the common shared parts of that middleware pipeline for your web requests makes sense to exist somewhere other than in the individual applications. It makes it easier to maintain, it makes it easier to version, it makes it easier to deploy. Right. All right. Yeah. Great. So we got. Thank you guys very much for coming. And uh, yeah, please feel free to come up. And uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to come and ask us. Thank you. Thank you.